What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And um, I bet Wiener today, but um, before we, I introduce him formally, um, you should check out some past episodes. You know, I've been doing this is, you know, Israel Business Leader Series. Melissa Navon, who Ben is friends with, uh, talks about Mobileye and their journey being acquired by Intel for $13.2 billion. I remember on my way in that day, Ben, I was thinking that point was 15, two. 15.2. 15.2, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to, <laughs> what's another oh, couple occasion. billion? Two billion. Um, two I was billion thinking, is what it used to be. I was thinking on my way in before that interview, I was like, wow, the point two is $200 million. That's just a point two. That's remarkable. Um, Yuri Adone, um, the author of The Unstoppable Startup, was talking about spending 20 years in high tech in Israel and it was a partner at Jerusalem Venture Partners. Um, so check out his book. Um, and you know, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran at Rise25. We help B2B businesses give to and connect to their dream 100, you know, best relationships, partnerships, clients through running their podcast. You know, for me, Ben, you know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my relationships and a podcast over the past over 10 years has been a way I can profile my favorite people on a platform and share their knowledge, share their thought leadership and what they're doing. So check it out. If you have questions, you can go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25media.com. Um, and I like to mention too, it was actually inspired by my grandfather who was a Holocaust survivor. So if you go on inspiredinsider.com, the about page, I actually have the video um, of the Holocaust Foundation doing an interview with him. And it's pretty, you know, if you are looking for something intense, it's not like a lighthearted interview, obviously. Uh, so check it out. Um, and excited to introduce today's guest. And I've had two other guests on the podcast that are part of Jump Speed's portfolio company, Rand Korber of Breezometer and Aaron Horowitz of Auto Lead Stars. So check out those interviews. Today, I've been Wiener, is the managing partner at Jump Speed, which is the first and only micro VC fund dedicated to investing in early stage startups that originate within the Jerusalem startup ecosystem. You know, Ben and I were talking, it's like early stage, a person and an idea sometimes. And he's gonna talk about what he looks for and is disciplined even in sorting through all the stuff with just a person and an idea or, or founders and an idea. And Jump Speed addresses the mismatch of supply and demand for the early stage capital in the capital of the startup nation. And he invests in what I was reading an article, Ben, hanging curveballs over the plate. So if you think investment strategy of Warren Buffett meets Ted Williams. Um, so Ben, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. Happy to be here. Thanks a lot. Um, let's talk about that. A guy or woman and an idea. Um, talk about one of the early interactions. I know I mentioned Auto Lead Star, Breezy Meter. You have several other portfolio companies. Talk about one of the stories early on when it was just like a person and idea and what, what you were looking at. Um, there are a couple of really good ones uh, that I, I, I've been really fortunate. You know, any investor is judged at the end of the day by the people that they invest in and the companies they invest in. Um, and I'm really privileged to have in my portfolio some just incredible, incredible people that I've been you know, privileged to back often with the first check that they got in their company. Um, there are a couple of really great origin, origination stories where um, – you know, let's say Breezometer, where Ron, you know, you had him on the on the on the on the, on the show. Um, Breezometer, uh, the two partners came to me before they had raised any capital. They were in a program in Jerusalem. A bunch of people, including somebody at JVP, where Uri Adoni used to work, uh, recommended that I meet with them. And um, you know, the, I wrote up the story when they were named uh, a year after I invested. They were named the most promising startup in the world by President Obama and the White House. That in and of itself is a great story, how they, they got called by the White House and they thought it was a prank call and they hung up the phone on the White House <laughs> and the White House called them back and said, they thought, they thought it was one of their friends like pranking them. 
And the White House called back and said, this really is the White House. You got to get over here in November to make you president. But before that, wow. um, about 10 months before, they were they were unfunded. And, and frankly, they were striking out because they had this idea for an air quality app, which they were going to sell on the app store for a couple bucks to mostly to mothers with uh, children with asthma. You know, amazing benefit to society. But, you know, and, and so this is sort of going to dovetail with two of your questions. A, what do you see? And B, how do you discipline? So, and three, like how do you, and C, whatever, A, B, C, to see how do you interact as an investor with these founders and, and treat them with respect? So I had been an entrepreneur for many years and I had felt, you know, that I was in many cases, like, like a lot of entrepreneurs, like disrespected by VCs who can often be very arrogant. And I felt, you know, once I was privileged to start a small fund, I was, you know, not of that nature and there was no way I was going to behave that way. So to, to ensure that, I promised myself that I would respond to any single entrepreneur that met with me in writing and give them, you know, that dangerous, like detailed feedback. Like it's not for me because, and a lot of investors, it's changing and a lot of them are coming around, but still to this day, many investors won't tell you like, first they won't even tell you no, but even if they do, they won't tell you why. So I met with Ron and his partner and uh, it wasn't for me. And it was clear to me why it wasn't for me. And I explained it to them. And I said, guys, I, it's really very fascinating. Um, I don't do consumer apps. That's one of my disciplines. Even to this day, I, I generally do not, I shy away from consumer related applications. I'm just not, it's not what I, you know, have expertise in. Um, and I certainly don't believe in paid apps. I don't, I don't think that that's, you know, very likely to succeed coming from Israel. Um, really great meeting you. And they came back and they said, you know, you're the first investor to give us that feedback. Hmm. They, they were, they had been pitching this paid app idea for, for months and they were striking out. And they said, you know, because you're the first person to uh, sort of bring this up, we'll tell you that we have this other idea for the technology. We can actually potentially sell, it's on the back burner, but we can potentially sell this technology to businesses in a B2B model, business to business. Um, you know, and, and I start to like finish their sentences. Like, oh my God, like you can sell that software to insurance companies and real estate companies and healthcare or whatever. And I remember I pounded on the table and I said, I am such an idiot that I did not see the use of this technology in the business context. And you guys, with all due respect, are idiots for choosing the app. Like, this is, <laughs> this, I love you guys, but this is the business. You know, if you want to go in this direction, call me back. And, um, and the rest, as they say, was history. Now, I want to be crystal clear because we're being recorded. I, I am not taking credit for what they did. They, they are brilliant engineers and scientists and they may have come to that on their own, but I was privileged to be the first one to sort of be a mensch and stand up and say, guys, here's why I'm not doing it. I, it triggered this other idea that they hadn't told anybody else about. And when I met other VCs later on, after they won these awards and they raised you know, millions of dollars and now they have you know, revenue and Fortune 500 customers, I met a VC recently who said to me, you know, I saw those Brizometer guys and I remember exactly, I have it written down. I saw them before you saw them. How did you, Ben, see what they became? I said, dude, I didn't see it. I told them that I wasn't interested and they came back with this other idea. I wasn't smart enough to see it. So the, the joke was that it wasn't that I was so brilliant. It, it was that I was so stupid that I said, okay, that's not for me. I couldn't see the other path. And I was fortunate enough just by mentioning that I wasn't interested in A, to have them come back with B. So that's, I think, a, a good indicative story of how sometimes doing the nice thing or the right thing can often lead to better business outcomes than being, you know, tough or arrogant or a jerk. Yes, it's true. Certain people have succeeded that way. But for me, that hasn't been the path. And, um, and I have evidence to show that when, in certain cases, when I did the nice thing without any hope of, you know, of, of producing a business outcome, some of my greatest business outcomes came from that. So I think that sort of wraps in one good story, like sort of A, how do you sit with the founders and sort of ask them about their business? B, how do you give them feedback in a proper way? And C, how do you, you know, not take credit when the company pivots and, and you know, and hits the quote unquote jackpot? Uh, I think we as investors often will use the word we, you know, there's a great, uh, I think it was in, Hahnemann's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, one of the great, you know, uh, behavioral economics books, they interview college kids the day after the college football game. And they ask them how the team did. If the team lost, the students would say they lost. 
if the team won, <laughs> the students would say we won, right? Yeah. So we, we as venture capitalists love to use the word we <laughs> when the companies succeed. And when they fail, we say, you know, they. But I try to be a little more careful and respectful because it's not we. We're we privileged to give them the money, you know, give them as much help as we can. They're the ones working night and day yeah. to, to change the world. And, um, and Rizomber, I think, is a good, you know, Ron, you know, is very dynamic. You spoke to him. He's an amazing person. And they're really doing something that, A, makes money, and B, makes the world a better place. And I think that's a, I, I don't make that a stipulation, but that's a, you'll see that that's like a recurrent theme in a lot of the companies that I back. I want to get goosebumps about the company. Those goosebumps could be economic. Like if it's just an amazing industry, it doesn't have to be curing cancer or saving people with mental health. But when it does, like Genetica Plus, which is hopefully going to solve the problem of mental health medication, or MDI Health, which is going to solve the problem of you know, adverse drug effects with medication cocktails, or MDGO, which is going to solve the problem of potentially like life-threatening injuries in car accidents. Um, it, it, it adds a lot of feel good to the economic you know, business analysis. Yeah. And Ben, I love, you know, that's a great lesson is like give candid feedback, you know, to people because you never know where it's going to go. And, and at the very least, it will just help them, you know, change and improve. And all feedback is good feedback. Right. There is a price to pay. Like if you, you know, uh, again, there are on the fringes, there are entrepreneurs who are, you know, let's say, you know, I, I want to be disrespectful of mental illness or whatever, but you have people that, that are unstable or that have issues. And, and you know, that may, there may be personality issues that, you know, cause an investor not to invest in a founder. I, I don't think you want to look them in the eyes and say, guys, you know, I'm not investing in you because I think you're unstable. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, exactly. You, want to find, you don't want to be, you don't want to be candid to that extent. Yeah. You don't have to tell them everything you're thinking about, but you have to give them some actionable feedback that is yeah. honest and real. And, and, and that's why, I publish the criteria on the, web, on the front page of the website. This is what I'm looking for. And usually when I, you know, I have to say no, you know, 99, 98% of the time. So that enables me to just point to that and say, guys, um, you really seem really great. This is outside of the sweet spot of what I'm looking for. Here's yeah. a couple of reasons why. And, and in some cases, you know, that email, like I said, in, in Brazometer's case, that was, I call it my million dollar email. I wrote them this email, it took me two minutes. And it changed the trajectory of my fund. It changed changed my life. You know, I'm, I'm privileged to be the first and one of the largest investors in the company. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, it, like I said, it has a lot. There are a lot of lessons wrapped up in that. But candid feedback is you have to be careful. You have to treat it like a sort of like a porcelain. You know, uh, like a like a piece of crystal. Like it's very valuable, but you have to treat it carefully. Yeah. Um, you have to handle it handle it with care. You have to use it. But you have to handle it with care. We'll talk about, Ben, some other companies and early on what that looked like. Um, but I want to talk about, there's probably ones you said no to that maybe was a really hard no for you that you toiled over. You're like, I'm, you know, it's on the fringe. Maybe it has like, you know, maybe talk about what you're looking, we'll talk about what you're looking for, but maybe it's got like four of these criteria, but it's missing one of them. And by the way, I think in book titles, and I know we'll talk about you have this great post where you talked about the 75 books you read. So I, I suggest people check that out. But I have your next book title name. You said it actually, um, potentially. So um, Goosebumps, like something Goosebumps and then a subhead, what I look for in high growth startups, early stage or something. So there's your next sure, book maybe. title. If I publish it, I'll split the royalties with you. Yeah, <laughs> we have it on recording. Um, but um, talk about a hard no. Like, what was a hard no that maybe it fit like almost all of it, but you just you couldn't get that last thing. Yeah, that's a good. That's really. Good you question. only you only invest in when I was looking at it. Maybe one company a year, maybe. No, it, I, well, I try to I I I try to invest in about one percent of what I see. I don't okay. do that uh, purposefully, but that's the benchmark. And that's yeah. been pretty, pretty consistent. So I see, you know, in Tel Aviv or in certainly in Silicon Valley, somebody like me would see thousands. I see from the Jerusalem ecosystem, I see probably hundreds, like two to three to 400 yeah. a year. Yeah. And I've consistently invested in between two and four companies a year. Got it. Uh, so 20, 20 companies over, over six and a half years is, uh, yeah, it's about that number. Mm -hmm. Um, so I've had some busy years. I've had some slow years. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I am pretty, pretty picky. So that means like one out of a hundred, um, is going to go all the way through the analysis. Um, in those 99 out of a hundred, 
which ones were really tough nos. Uh, yeah. there, there were a couple. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to go into specific specific examples, but there were some tough ones where uh, I'll, I'll say it a little bit differently. Most, if you look at, uh, you know, I don't want to belabor like the every investor has their own criteria. My criteria on the website. The first I I, I found that because I like um, dynamic people, I found that I was falling in love with founders, you know, not, not literally, but like falling, yeah. falling in love with founders um, and sort of glossing over some of the market issues that if I had been more honest, you know, I would be, I would have, that would have stopped me. So I purposefully kind of hit the brakes after about a year or two and redid the order of the, like a quarterback in football, you have your check downs. So my check down order switched and I start in the order that the website uh, says. So I start with the market, uh, and this is based on lots of reading. You know, if you read like Mark Andreessen has this you know, seminal, important piece where he writes, you know, in 2007, as he's becoming an investor, you know, in a classic Andreessen style, he writes, you know, the only thing that matters. Like this is like the most important article that you could ever read as an investor. And he basically orders, you know, market product team. And he puts team last, hmm. which is very controversial because most VCs at the time, and even today, you know, say, we invest in teams, we invest in teams. And Andreessen says, you know, give me a, you know, four Nobel Prize laureates building a piece of garbage and, you know, it's not going to work. Like the market has to be, <laughs> right. and, and, the, and the corollary is also true. You can have, you know, a bunch of 19 year olds who have never done anything, but if they hit that magic, you know, Facebook or whatever, that thing is going to take off. And even if they had no background whatsoever and, and maybe poor interpersonal skills, the company could still succeed. So you want to start with market and then go to product and then go to team. And that has been a great safeguard for me because that has prevented me from, there were, there were some amazing founders. I can think of a few in the last couple of years, just people that you want to bring home and introduce to your wife and kids. They're just so great, great people, committed, hungry, but the market wasn't the right market for me. And, and that enabled me, my, my check down enabled me to say, you know what? I really like you a lot. You're fantastic. I'm rooting for you, but this is still not the company that I, you know, that I want to back. So there were a bunch of those that started that way where I loved the people, but just the market and the product weren't right for me. And then you just give them this heartfelt, you know, no, where you, you know, you say like legitimately, I really, really like you. I'm really rooting for you. And there are a few founders today. They still don't understand it. I don't think completely. There are a bunch of founders in the ecosystem that I'm still behind the scenes trying to help. I'm introducing them to VCs and other investors. And I said no to them. I didn't invest in them. And there's, they say to me like, Ben, we don't understand. Like, why are you doing this? You know? And I say to them, well, I like you. I want you to succeed. I just, you know, didn't fit my it's framework. nothing personal. Yeah. It's not, it's, the, it's, it's nothing personal at all. It's that, the opposite. Like, I really like you and I want you to succeed. But I, you know, I have my criteria. I have, you know, 70 or 60 investors that gave me their money. I promised them that I'm looking for these things. This is not that. But I'm still going to, you know, try to help you. So there were a bunch like that where I really liked the person. But for whatever reason, the market wasn't a good fit for my limited, you know, experience and expertise. And I had to say, you know what? Really like you a lot. Not for me. Um, ben, you know, when I look at what you're looking for, is the order to start with paradigm shift? Is it paradigm well, shift say, and then pain? I would say pain first. Like, okay. I, you know, I want to, I want to rule out things that are, you know, maybe great opportunities, but aren't solving a painful problem. And I, I recognize that that's going to rule out a bunch that would have ruled out, you know, if I would have sat with Zuckerberg, if he had been from Jerusalem, you know, I would have said no, like, and, and, I, and I wouldn't have regretted it afterwards, even, even though it became one of the world's most valuable companies, because for every one of those, there would have been a thousand that were just like it. And the point is, I'm not good. It's, it's not about what I believe in. It's about what I understand about myself. I'm one, I'm a solo GP. I have my own set of limitations. I am not good at evaluating opportunities that are greenfield, super interesting, but don't solve a problem. My brain works better when you can frame it for me in terms of a problem that is now or in the near term. And that for some reason, number two, the current solutions are grossly inadequate. Like for some reason, there's this miss, I love mismatches. You can hear that throughout what I say. Like I love the mismatch of Jerusalem. I, lo I love the mismatch of gender that, that women don't get their fair shake. And I've been privileged to back a whole bunch of women uh, founders. I love these mismatches that are unfair or that are illogical. So, get back to the criteria. This is huge pain, number one. Number two, current solutions are grossly inadequate. For some reason, the seven and a half billion people on this planet have not figured out an even closely adequate solution for this problem. Maybe because it's new. Maybe because the technologies weren't available. Maybe because just nobody realized it. 
Um, and, and that is going to filter out probably 85% of starter pitches because most of them, frankly, even they even themselves can't honestly say that they that they think that current solutions are grossly inadequate. They'll say, yeah, we're, we're an optimization. We're better than the rest. But for me, and that might be fine, and those companies might be very successful, for me, I need to see something that's a, that jumps to number three, which is a paradigm shift, game-changing, order of magnitude, jump to solve all those problems conclusively and in a way that nobody's even come close. And, and that, that is so narrow that I'm not even gonna get to the team if I, you know, if I can't get those through, through those things. And, and, uh, and then we get to the team and the, the passion and the, the people and you know, the, the human element of, of, the, of the company. So that would be the, the order that I would look at things. And I'm pretty disciplined about it. I write it up, I, I, write, I write down a memo, I make sure that I'm checking my homework, that I'm not skipping steps. Um, and you know, people, you could debate it. You know, like you could look at some of the companies I've invested in and say, Ben, I, I don't see it. I don't know what you're thinking here. Like, this is not a paradigm shift or, there, you know, but at least I believed at the time that it fit that criteria. You mentioned, Ben, also, okay, you saw, you know, ran and you're like, we don't do consumer apps. Okay. Um, paid consumer apps. What's, what's another one of those? I found this is not, this is not a fit for you. I'm just turning on my air conditioner. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, hardware devices, uh, medical devices, any kind of hardware, again, uh, drones. Um, not that I don't believe in those things. I believe a lot, but I just don't believe that I'm good at, at picking those or backing them. So there you know, pharmaceuticals, anything that requires FDA approval, anything that's a physical device. Um, I, I have invested in, in a company that pivoted towards a physical device. And I wonder, you know, if I had seen them, if I knew when I invested that they were going to incorporate a physical device, I wonder if I would have invested. Um, I'm happy that I did. I think it's going to work out great. But I wonder, you know, if they would have come in the door with that as part of the plan. I wonder if I would have bent uh, far enough to, to include it or not. Um, so these are not, I wouldn't say these are completely inviolable. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't have a legal boundary, but these are, you know, heavy, 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 strong boundaries or, or preferences, I would say. Um, so, you know, never, never say never, but I've never seriously looked at a medical device. I, I don't think I ever would. Yeah. Um, but I have looked at some things that involve like Genetica Plus has a whole bunch of people in white coats growing synthetic human brains in a, in a refrigerator. In Jerusalem, so I don't, I don't know if I would have, you know, actively looked for something like that, but it was pretty fascinating when I saw it. So, and I'm glad I did. Let's talk about some of the companies um, and what you saw early on, but and maybe just yeah. give a, a brief, like Genetica, for instance. Maybe talk for a second, just what do they do, and then what did, what was it like uh, when they, you talked to them early on? Genetica was a great one. I mean, Talia Cohen Salal, Doctor Talia Cohen Salal, is just, I mean, an incredible. Uh, world, really like world-class neuroscientist trained at uh, Oxford undergrad, UCL PhD, Columbia University of New York postdoc. I mean, this is a woman who like is an expert in her field of neuroscience and moves to Israel and has this idea to sort of extend the research that she did in the lab to solve a very specific problem. The problem is that unfortunately, and this is tragic and it's only getting worse through COVID, there are hundreds of millions of people in the world who are diagnosed or will be shortly diagnosed with severe clinical depression. And the problem is that's a problem in and of itself. The, the next problem is that there are 50 to 70 medications already approved on the market for, for uh, clinical depression and psychiatrists do not know when, they don't have a conclusive way to know when they meet the patient and diagnose them, which of those drugs will match that patient's physiology, neuropsychology, whatever. And so it's trial and error. We live in 2000, you know, 2020, and these well-trained doctors are, you know, let's try this for a couple of weeks, see if it works. And I don't need to tell you how tragic some of these results are. We've had, you know, people that we know, children of people that we know, I mean, just terrible, terrible outcomes of people under treatment where the treatment isn't working. And so Talia comes and says, well, we know what the brain looks like when the drug works. The problem is that nobody is going to submit to letting us cut their brain open and test, you know, look inside and see if the drug's working. But what if we can grow a copy of the brain wow. in a Petri dish of that person? 
So they could take Ben Wieners. Then they, they could put it on the mantle. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it, it's insane. So we have a refrigerator in Jerusalem oh. that right now has in Petri dishes, actual, not the whole brain, not the goopy big thing, but like neurons, but actual neurons grown from blood samples of actual human beings. And those neurons, we believe, mimic the actual activity of the actual person's brain. Mm. And therefore, in the lab, you can test all the different drugs on copies of those neurons after a short period of time, days, weeks, maybe even days, maybe one day, even hours. See if the neuron reacts the right way to the drug, and bingo, you find your match. And then you call, you know, Mr. Smith and say, hey, good news, I found the drug that should work. Let's try this one first. Let's, mm. let's move this one up the chain. And that could be game-changing, life-changing, totally. healthcare costs go down by billions, lives lost go down by millions. You just have an incredible dynamic, you know, uh, result on, on humankind, right? So you asked me, like, how I felt when I heard that pitch. Was I that the original that. pitch? Was that the original the, idea? The original, pitch, the original pitch was a one-minute pitch. There was a program here in Jerusalem, and there were 60 part 55 participants, and it was about an hour long. Each one had one 60-second on the clock. And Talia, I had never met her before. She clocked in at like, you know, 50. Everybody kind of ran over and they banged the gong. She banged out this pitch in perfect, you know, British English at like 59 point, you know, 46. Like clearly she had practiced. I did not understand a word of what she was talking about. <laughs> but I was, but I was like, again, goosebumps. Like, I don't know what she just said, but there's something there. I, so I went over to her afterwards and I said, you know, that wasn't enough time. Can we meet, you know, can I hear the whole pitch? And, uh, and the rest is, as they say, history. Like, you know, in an hour meeting, she had plenty of time to explain the problem and, and her solution. And wow, am I, am I happy that I met her? I mean, she, she is just that incredible. And, I, and I, I get that excited about most, if not all, of the founders of my portfolio. Like, they, they just get you to that goosebump level where, you know, if you can just get the story across right, the listener will often say, wow, you know, I, maybe they won't invest or maybe they won't go all the way, but they at least say, wow, that is a really incredible thing. I did not know that or I was not aware of that. Or I didn't realize you could solve the problem that way. And I want to get to that level when I, when I put even the first couple hundred thousand dollars into a, into a startup. But do you that's, remember, that's what did you, what was it? But it was 60 seconds and you knew that it was something. What, do you remember anything about what she said? If, if you look up Talia on the web, like as opposed to me, she has a bunch of, she's won a bunch of awards. She's spoken a bunch of times. I mean, she's just so articulate. She's so knowledgeable about her space. And you can, like, you know, if you hear a scientist talking about a field that you don't necessarily know, you can still often tell if they're BSing or if they really have a handle on their material. She is in that latter category. Like, it's just obvious that she knows what she's talking about. So I didn't understand all the details, but I knew that I, there was enough there that I wanted to, you know, dig deeper and find out more. Was that in the original idea of kind of creating this artificial brain to test medication? Was that early on what I, she wanted to do? I, I think in the 60 seconds, she didn't go into that level of detail. But I think yeah. at one point when we first met, or the second meeting, I, I think I said to her, so you're growing like brains in a dish? <laughs> and she said, uh, yeah, I guess kind of. Like, not, not the whole brain. You know, it's just like, wow, that is, that is you know, incredible. That's amazing. Yeah, so we have, you know, I've gone to visit the brains. We have, uh, we've made some field trips to the fridge. Uh, we, we call it like the nursery. You know, we, we ask, you know, how they're growing. <laughs> I, we don't want to give them names because there are like millions of them. But I asked her if she could name one after me. Yeah, nice. Um, what about Auto Lead Star? What was the early conversation like for the, with that? So Auto Lead Star was very different. Auto Lead Star was, from, was one of my first investments in 2014. So I had just launched the fund. I was by my own admission, much less discipline. And Auto Lead Star was an outlier in many ways. Number one, of all the people that I backed, our own was the only one who I knew before. So I started the fund in, let's say, November 2013. Uh, by, Jan by January 2014, I was meeting with companies. And um, I had heard, I had kn known him from his prior work as a nonprofit leader. I had actually volunteered for him when he ran a, a nonprofit called Present Tense. So I'd gotten to know him and I knew he was just an amazing, I'll tell you sort of a funny postscript to the story. I knew that he was an amazing person, just a very dynamic leader. And I, call, I reached out to him and said, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but I have a fund and I hear you have a startup, <laughs> you know, like your peanut butter and my chocolate, like let's get together and, and see if, uh, if it's of interest. And it was not 
called Auto Leads Are. It was called 40 Nuggets, and it was just a generic platform for website traffic management. It had nothing to do with car dealerships. And um, so I didn't have as much of a discipline. I really liked him, and I kind of just made a bet on him and his team. And again, I'm happy that I did, uh, because when they ultimately pivoted into the auto dealership vertical as an exclusive focus, that was probably two years after I had invested. And I was monitoring that decision along the way. I was definitely in favor of it. But again, can I take credit for having seen that market? Absolutely not. I was fortunate to be in the company before they pivoted. They pivoted. It's working out for them. Um, and then it turned out. So I, I've known our own for, uh, I don't know, probably 15 years between his nonprofit activity and then the last seven years as an investor. And um, to make, again, a very, very funny long story short, um, I know that our own sister is married to this person who lives in Jerusalem. And my cousin, uh, my only other relative in the country was like here for a little bit. Um, had, they got pregnant, had a baby. My teenage son went to the hospital to take my aunt who was visiting. And anyway, my, my, my son sees my cousin hugging this very tall guy, former basketball player. And my son recognizes the guy and says to my cousin, hey, that's, you know, so-and-so. And they had never, they each had a baby that morning. Each had a baby boy, my cousin and, and this guy. And they come back to the house and like, tell me the story. And um, my grandmother was visiting. She was 91 years old. She was visiting. She happened to be in our house. She's listening to the story. She says, oh, that basketball player, he's related to us. I'm like, wow, oh, grandma, what are you talking about? She goes, no, he's not. His wife is Horowitz from Cleveland. I'm like, that's Aaron Horowitz's sister. So I'm like, grandma, explain what you're talking about. And she basically, <laughs> after, after like a minute, it turns out that what she's saying is that Aaron Horowitz and I are fourth cousins. We had the same great, great grandfather, which I, we had no wow. idea. We've known each other for 15 years. That's true and, Jewish and, geography. So I called, man, this I is like, called Aaron. <laughs> yeah, so I called Aaron like, hey, congratulations on your nephew. He's like, how do you know that I had a nephew? I'm like, dude, you're my fourth cousin. Your great, <laughs> your great grandfather was, was David, you know, Ween from like Poland. He's like, Ben, what are you talking about? I said, get over here and meet my grandma. And he come, so he was over like that night and we have this whole like family reunion with pictures. We had no idea. We were wow. close, close friends, investor in the company. And it turns out that we're fourth cousins. So I told him that I have to disclose to all my investors that, you know, I'm violating like nepotism rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my family. But so it's a very small world. And it turns out that you always have to be nice to people because you may end up being their fourth cousin. The exact, love it. How did you go, Ben, from lawyer to investor? Because I don't know if people know you were, your professional career was as a corporate lawyer in New York and in Israel, you as a clerk on the Israel Supreme Court. Yeah. So I'll do it really briefly. Yeah. Um, and, and honestly, so I graduated Columbia Law School in 96, 1996, uh, got a job at a law firm in New York like everybody else, uh, wanted to move to Israel at some point later in my life. I wasn't sure when. Thankfully, my wife was, you know, also interested, even, maybe even more than me. And we decided that we would sort of have a trial year. The firm that I got a job at was very, uh, you know, very supportive of people deferring and taking clerkships. And so I applied to the Israel Supreme Court and said, hey, we can live in Israel for a year. And I got accepted by actually, I got offers from three different justices on the court. And I picked one and we came to Israel for the year after graduation. I pushed off my job in New York. And that was 1996, 97. We loved it. We lived in Jerusalem. It was amazing. And I said, we said to each other, like midway through the year, oh my God, we have to accelerate our plans. Like we had a 10 year plan. It's now like a, a one year plan. Hmm. So I, I went back to New York and I was obligated to like practice for this firm for a little while. But the minute I hit the ground in New York, I was back on the phone, like talking to people that I knew back in Israel. And within about a year and a half, I had lined up a job offer and we moved back to Jerusalem uh, full time. Only time I ever bought a one way ticket to another country. It's, it's terrifying, but it's very cool. Um, so we you know, loaded the kids up onto a plane, moved to Jerusalem. That was 97. Uh, sorry, 98. And by 99, I had left law completely. I was practicing law in Tel Aviv. Um, and I met a young guy who had an idea for a startup. And Jerusalem at the time was very vibrant. Like this sort of gets into the second part of your story. How did you get into venture capital? I never thought I was going to be an investor. I never had any money. And I never thought anybody would want to trust me with their money to invest. But in 98, uh, 99, I joined this 
other person. We started a startup in Jerusalem. It was a great time to be in startups in Jerusalem. There was money like rolling through the streets. There were wealthy investors, both Israeli and expat, like American, British. I'm telling you, you could walk into a coffee shop in Jerusalem in 1999. This is, you know, dot-com craze, right? It, you would just see people strewn out across the coffee shop, usually a young person sitting with a laptop, sitting across from like a silver-haired person, you know, pitching eagerly. And people were just writing checks. And we, we got funded. Um, and then I did that again the following year, joined a second startup. That one didn't work out. Immediately joined a second startup. Again, these were not my ideas. These were, I was a young person. And I was the, the deal person or the investor person within the company. And it was great. And I thought, okay, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. I'll be the number two person in an Israeli startup company, helping them you know, get back over the ocean, do the business deals, raise the money, use my professional expertise to do that. And everything hit a brick wall in 2002. So everything was going fine. 2002, you have the dot-com bubble crash, you know, reverberation hitting Israel. You have the second intifada breaking out. And in my opinion, there was like a double or triple whammy that crushed the young Jerusalem scene, whereas the Tel Aviv scene was already big enough and, and self-sustaining enough to sort of survive and thrive. The, the joke is that Moise's company, Mobileye, was already in existence at that point, and nobody knew about it, but there was like this little company called Mobileye in Jerusalem that was founded, was able to be born before the Jerusalem crash of 2001, 2002, and it was lucky enough to survive all the way to the 2010s when autonomous driving became a thing. And then Intel ultimately buys them for $15.2 billion. So you have this joke of a complete wipeout of the Jerusalem startup scene from about 2002 to about 2013. All that while, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of startups getting funded an hour away in Tel Aviv. All the investors moving to Tel Aviv and the Tel Aviv area to, to focus there. Mobileye quietly becoming the largest exit ever in Israeli history back in Jerusalem. It was this crazy mismatch of like, you can't build a big company in Jerusalem, but yet Jerusalem was building actually by 2004, by 2017, Jerusalem had built the two largest exits in Israeli history, We're both from Jerusalem, not from Tel Aviv. It was Mobileye at 15.2 and NDS at about 5 billion to Cisco in 2014. So by 2017, we could say to people, 95% of the startups are in Tel Aviv. 95% of the capital is in Tel Aviv. The two largest exits in Israeli history are actually in Jerusalem because they were fortunate to get born before everything got crushed. And that's what led to me starting JumpSpeed. So again, I don't want to belabor the whole story, but basically from 02 to about 2013, I was, you know, without a cause. You know, I had moved to this country to be the number two guy in startups and there were no more startups in Jerusalem. I worked for a couple other, I worked for a big publicly traded company doing corporate debt. De I went to Tel Aviv a lot to like meet with other companies to try to get jobs. But I, to be perfectly honest, I really bounced around a lot in the prime years of my career, right? And then 2013, I was 43 with seven kids. And, seven kids, uh, wow. Seven kids, three born in America, four born here, getting older, getting hungrier, wanting to do things in their lives. And my last job, like, you know, kind of finished or fell apart or whatever you want to say. And I had nothing to do. And that's a really bad place to be. In Jerusalem where nothing had happened in like over 10 years. And I'm not, I'm not over dramatizing this. Like at that point in the summer of 2013, I had uh, an idea from my own startup. And it was actually a consumer app, which is probably why I'm so allergic to consumer apps. <laughs> stupid, stupid idea for consumer app. And it was the only thing I could hang on to. And I needed, you know, maybe twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars to pay a couple college kids to like build this app and just put it up on the app store and see if it worked. And I could not find fifty thousand. And then I could not find twenty-five thousand. There was just nobody to talk to. We had raised millions for my first two startups in Jerusalem fifteen years before. And now there was nobody to talk to. And then I would go to Tel Aviv and get very little audience with anybody because A, I was from Jerusalem, B it was a consumer app. C and D and E and F, it was just, I was striking out. And there was one other person in Jerusalem, as far as I knew, I was introduced by a neighbor to another guy who had a, his own idea for a startup. He also was looking for about 50,000. And I thought we were the only two wackos in Jerusalem that were trying to start startups. And the deal was whoever raised the 50K first, we would do that idea. And that's how bad things were. And, and in the middle of that summer, I 
get invited on Facebook to a group. I'll never forget this. I love telling the story, but it's, it's true. It happened exactly this way. I get invited to a group called Jerusalem Startup Founders Group, which I thought was somebody making like a vulgar joke. There were no Jerusalem Startup Founders. So I joined the group just to see what the joke was. And the next thing I know, I'm, I'm invited to something called Pitch Night. You know, come pitch your startup at some bar downtown on King George Street on like a Tuesday night. I'm like, whoever these people are found an investor. Like, because why else would you have a pitch night? And there must be other people. So I'd say to my wife, listen, is it okay, honey, if I go to this bar? I don't go to bars. I'm married. I'm 43 with seven kids. She's like, listen, we got to get some money <laughs> for this thing. Go for it. So I go down to this bar. In the back of the bar, there are like over 40 kids. They were all half my age for sure. And there's a young guy in the middle. He's clearly the ringleader. He's got a rented speaker and a microphone. And everyone's lined up behind him and they're pitching. Like he's in charge with a stopwatch of like lining them up. Everyone's doing like three minute pitches. But to whom? So I get online and I'm like ready to pitch my stupid startup idea. And I pull the shirt of the guy in front of me. I say, excuse me, you know, who are we pitching? He goes, what do you mean? I said, who's the investor? There's nobody here who looks old enough to drink a beer, let alone like write a check. He says, you idiot, this is Jerusalem. There are no investors, we're pitching ourselves. <laughs> I'll never forget it. He actually said that to me. And I said, you're right. I, I, know, I know you're right, I've been trying. Who is this guy? So it turned out that it was, this was like the beginning of the revolution. This was like, I, I came home and I had, like the craziest look on my face, like really like insane. And my wife said to me, wow, what happened? I said, it was unbelievable. She said, you found an investor? I said, no, there were no investors there. She said, I'm having trouble understanding why this is so amazing. And I said, honey, I remember I've said this out loud. I will swear that I said this out loud. I said, honey, my startup is not my startup. My startup is my city. Jerusalem is starting up again. And nobody knows it. Nobody sees it because they've all given up on this place like 10 years ago. And, and I knew who the people were. I knew that they wouldn't know about this group forming in these bars because it was so bohemian, it was so rugged, but it was so pure and raw. And so clearly I spent the rest of that night not pitching my startup, but I was like working the crowd. Like, who are you? Where, where are you from? What are you working on? And they were students and, and postdocs and, and entrepreneurs. And I would say about half of them had ideas that sounded legit. So again, to make a really, really long story short, that became just that night I got home in the summer, probably June, July, 2013, put my startup to the side and started to work on a thesis of Jerusalem only early stage investment. A, is there critical mass? Because I knew that the, you know, the, the ratio is like one to a hundred of success. So were there at least a hundred early stage startups in formation? B, where were they? And could I, as a quiet person, kind of introverted, could I possibly find all hundred before anybody else did? C, could I develop a methodology for picking? Because I had never really invested before. And then D, where the heck was I going to get the money to do this? Like it was, I, I couldn't even get a red nickel from my stupid startup. And you can imagine how funny the pitches were. I, I pitched, I found anybody, that, I had no budget to travel. So I couldn't travel to America to like pitch wealthy people. I had to find that money in Jerusalem, which was a nuclear you know, wasteland of startups. So I, I went to, I, I think probably the best story of that section was I, I met with a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, and uh, had coffee with him. And I told him my idea. And his family, you know, was a wealthy family. I figured just based on the relationship, they would throw me a couple bucks to get me started. And he said to me after like a half hour, he just looked, he looked terrible. He looked like, he looked like he was going to cry. <laughs> and he leaned over the coffee table in the coffee shop and he said, Ben, I have to cut you off. I really like you. You're such a good guy. Please don't do this. This is never going to work. And you're not going to find out right away that it's not going to work. It's gonna, you're going to be chasing this for six months, for a year. Nobody's going to give you any money. You're going to waste a year of your life trying to get this off the ground. Just go do something else. And, and you know, on the odds, he was probably right. Like, it was insane. Nobody was going to, you know, here's my pitch. Hi, my name is Ben. I've never invested before. I'd like, to give me, I'd like and I, I, I would say this to people just to get, to get the elephant out of the room. I would say, listen, my name is Ben. I've never invested before. Um, I'd like you to give me some of your hard-earned money, and I'm going to invest it only in one city, that city being Jerusalem, where nothing good has happened in over 10 years. And then they would laugh, and then I would, and then I would say, okay, now that we got that out of the way. It's a great pitch. You know, yeah. And then I would say, let me show you the data. Let me show you what I found. And let me show you some examples. And let me show you my methodology. And let me show you some of the companies that are succeeding. 
And my thesis is that there's this massive mismatch and we can get into these companies for pennies on the dollar. And I was fortunate, lucky to find basically two really, really, you know, interesting people who backed me to get started and then the rest, you know, snowballed. So it is a very unusual story. People ask me, how do you break into venture capital? Like you do not want to know and you do not want to follow my path. It was insane. Ben, first of all, I have one last question and I appreciate you sharing all of your knowledge, your stories. It's amazing. And um, everyone should check out jumpspeed.co. Um, yeah. Check it out. Check out what they're doing. If you have, I mean, I guess if you're a Jerusalem, like what, what um, before I ask the last question, who should be contacting you specifically? Early stage founders whose startup is either based in Jerusalem or is being formed in Jerusalem. Not people who, you know, I get people, oh, I studied in Jerusalem. I live in Jerusalem, but I'm going to start the startup in Haifa or Tel Aviv. You know, generally not interested. It's got to be a product, somehow a product of the Jerusalem ecosystem. Either it's at Hebrew U or it's in one of the accelerator programs where it's just, you know, people working out of their apartments now in, in COVID. Um, but it should be some nexus, some legitimate connection to the Jerusalem ecosystem. I mean, I'm, I'm liberal about how I define that, but it has to have some legitimate claim to be a product of the Jerusalem ecosystem. Yeah. So if you know someone or you are someone in Jerusalem ecosystem, check out jumpspeed.co, check out what they're doing. Last question, Ben, um, you know, I know you're a big reader and you released this awesome article about you, the 70 books you read um, one year. And I'm curious, you know, there was, there was books like Loon Shots, um, Secrets of Sand Hill Road, range why generals triumph in specialized world and many more what's something this year that you suggest or or maybe like an all-time favorite maybe it's this year maybe it's not that people should check out um that you liked that is so hard i mean it really depends on <laughs> depends on what you're looking for i mean yeah you know it, you know i'm not a huge fan of business books um even though i read a lot of them a lot of them are i feel often you kind of feel like gypped like they kind of reverse back ended their theories into a couple examples that they picked out of, you know, the, the sea of, of, uh, of data to justify what they do. Um, but in terms of like in our space, in the venture capital space, I, I like basically force my portfolio company founders to read a very, very important book, short book called seven powers by Hamilton Helmer. I mean, this is a book that is like a Bible among venture capitalists and, mm -hmm. and very, very knowledgeable founders. Reed Hastings of Netflix, uh, Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn, Daniel Eck of Spotify, basically say, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, basically say this is like one of the most important books they ever read. So uh, it's a very important book about basically distilling really the only, he claims really the only seven uh, business strategies that lead to long-term prolonged competitive advantage and growth in the technology industry. So, you know, that's a pretty big plug for a book. I mean, if you can have a secret seven secrets of success. And these are, you know, really proven out by, by case studies, uh, a lot of economics in there. So I, I have become a big fan of that book on the business side. Um, on the non-business side, I mean, there's just so many inspirational things to read. Um, you know, I, I would say you can't get better than the meaning of life. And I think, um, you know, Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, is such a powerful book. You referenced your father, your father, grandfather. Grandfather, father, yeah. Survivor, grandfather. So Viktor Frankl's book, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, yeah. Man's Search for Meaning is literally about like the meaning of life. Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. And lest you think that this is like a depressing Holocaust book, this is the, one of the most positive, uplifting books uh, that you could ever read in your life. And when you put it in the context of a guy who went through living hell, it is unbelievable to read. Um, it's like half his biographical account and then half his, his the body of his uh, psychoanalytic theory which basically leads to uh the answer of like literally like what's the meaning of life and if you like that book there's a book that's very similar uh by a woman named dr uh edith eager who actually met frankel and was very inspired by him she herself holocaust survivor and the book is written similar like similar genre about her experiences similar positive outcome and philosophical or psychological approach i think her book is actually even better written maybe even more compelling there's some incredible stories about her life and you read that book you just put it down and you're like wow you know game over this is this is the only book i ever need to read in my life you know it can, it can really give you a reset about your priorities and you're thinking about good and evil bad and good 
purpose of life. So I, I don't think I think anything after that is kind of like a step down. But I, you know, it's sort of like saying to somebody who runs a lot, you know, what's the single best you know mile to run? You know, you don't run just that same mile over and over again. It's a workout of your brain, and you should read lots of different things. Um, you're going to pick up different things from even the most random book. Uh, so I don't think there's only one thing that I would recommend. But if I had to, I had to go on a desert island, you know, with one book, I would say maybe two. I would yeah. maybe take, you know, Frankel's. Uh, I have a good friend who said, if, if I was forced to be on a desert island with only one book, you know what book it would be? How to Build a Boat. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one i like that <laughs> yeah you can, very smart you can pay you can pay me half royalties for that one. <laughs> ben i want to be the first one to thank you thanks for sharing your knowledge and your stories everyone check out jumpspeed.co thanks everyone what i got you can't buy it resides between my eyes walk through the fire came out better on the other side like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand